Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. We have finished couple of hands on session about how to use mass spectrometry data analysis using protege software. You also gone through many of the basic concepts of looking at mass spectrometry data. Today we have another distinguished scientist Dr. Debashi Das who is a professor at CSIR IGIB institute in Delhi. Dr. Das is going to talk about integrative proteogenomics approaches in understanding of human proteoforms. As you know proteoforms are various modified forms of a protein molecules after different modifications in a living system. In this lecture Dr. Das will talk about the importance of proteoforms in human system by taking a reference of a research paper by Dr. Rudy Ebert Sold and also by sharing some of the work done in his own lab. Dr. Das will also provide you information for some of the repositories available to look at the protein proteoforms. So, let us welcome Dr. Debashis to tell us about integrative approaches, what proteoforms are and their role in clinical biology. The topic I chose today to share with you is an, an integrative proteogenomics approach to unravel human proteoforms. So, this title has three uh, terminology which needs attention. One of course, proteogenomics, the conference is on that. The second one is proteoform, we will try to understand what are these proteoforms I am talking about and the third is the integrative approach. And the integrative approach is what I mostly uh, work on and uh, so my major thrust will be the approach by which we identify the proteoforms. As you can see uh, very nicely covered in Nature uh, Methods 2013 and later on in 2014 uh, expert review on proteomics. Proteoform actually the all the alternate forms of the protein which can arise because of alternate splicing the mRNA and any variation in or the translational errors all of them put together or the even the amino acid modification all of them put together can lead to uh, gener generation of a variety of prote proteoforms of a sim same protein. Now all this while we have been talking about the missing protein. So, we had a catalog of human protein and we were looking for uh, what are the protein that has a transcript evidence and do not have a protein evidence. Now, from there on we move to identify all the proteoforms. So, there are expected to be around 1 lakh proteoforms, the number can vary, but this is what people guess and which are those proteoforms that are active, that are functional, some of them are involved in diseases. So, discovery of this proteoform actually can give a better understanding of the functioning of the tissues. So, Rudy very nicely covered this uh, area in nature chemical biology this year 2018 that how the protein proteoforms will be implicated in, in the future of biology. So, we need to understand first of all where are these proteoforms, where are they expressed and what are the possible roles of these proteoforms we need to understand. But before we go there we need to understand where are these proteoforms a tissue wise atlas of the proteoform need to be done and that is what the research topic on which my student Anurag who is in the audience uh, he works on and some of the work that I will be presenting is done by him. Now, some basic couple of slides I have kept for those audience who are new uh, to this area. So, how do we detect first of all the peptides in a shotgun uh, proteomics experiment mass spectrometry. The left hand side which I never do, the experimentalists do, protein extraction, digestion, injection into the, uh, the machine and then getting the spectra. And my lab starts from here and do, does do the uh, right hand side job. So, creation of a database which is very important, unless we create the right kind of a database, we will not get the answer. So, this database creation, I will uh, little bit delve into this theoretical digested peptides generation. So, this is a rule based, so there is nothing much here and then the 
peptide simulated fragment generation which will create which will give us a theoretical spectra. Now, matching of the theoretical spectra with the experimental spectra and thereby giving a score to this is what is needed. So, here is an example there are three words I have written here allergy, gallery and largely they are constituting of the same alphabets. So, the amino acid composition are the same, so but the peptides are different. So, in that case the answer lies in the MSMS the fragmentation pattern of these uh, the, the fragments that we will generate from these three peptides and a matching will be done peptide spectrum match scorer. So, this is different for different algorithms how mascot works, how sequest works, how tandem works all these scorers will differ in their way of giving a score to this, but however all of them will get some of the other score. So, now it depends on us or on the method to say who has passed and who has not. So, what is the passing score here nobody knows and in fact that can be a debate here to do that people take this approach they create a decoy database, a decoy database is a falsified database a database which do not contain the natural proteins. So, the proteins read from right to left may be or randomized shuffling shuffled sequences and the target sequence and when you draw a threshold that threshold actually uh, divides the true positives from the false positive. To do this there are many such search engines are available most of them you are familiar the, the one that masterpiece is developed in my lab and all others are also available uh, in the uh, domain and many more also have come up come across. So, what they do is that they give us a lot of peptides that are identified with a score, but then some of them are positive some of them are negative. Whereas, in a decoy database we know for sure that the peptide that we have got and the score distribution have we have got are all false. Now, a comparison between this target and the decoy and a proper threshold will let us know what is exactly the passing score. So, what is that what is that we generally say the false discovery rate the false discovery rate is generally calculated like this every one incorrect in 100 correct. So, 1 in 100 is the false discovery rate or 5 percent false discovery rate 5 incorrect is allowed for 100 uh, true positives. So, this was again uh, very nicely covered by Nesvisky in journal of proteomics 2010 you people can go and read this uh, article very nicely written which says that all the target 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 all of a sudden the decoy comes. So, FDR is number of decoy divided by total number of uh, um, peptides that we have identified from the target. So, this is how we get to know the FDR at the peptide level at the PSM level, but then the next challenge would be to identify the protein FDR protein level FDR we will see. Now, the decoy database as I told is a uh, reverse or randomized sequence alteration of the original sequence. So, that we can keep the amino acid composition intact we can keep uh, all other properties of the uh, protein while shuffling all these amino acids. And this is already I have covered. So, this is 0 percent FDR when no red is above this score no, no red is there, but this is too purist an approach. So, what we generally do we reduce our bar in such a way that we accept few allow few reds and get some more greens into our search results and that is how uh, the PSMs are obtained and from there the story begins we get peptides we match these peptides back to the proteins and from this the protein we infer what are the protein that are uh, true for our experimental uh, data. So, there are two ways one can do uh, uh, FDR calculation one is a concatenated search another is separate in, in concatenated what you do actually you merge the target and the decoy into one database whereas, in a separate search you search in the target separately you search in the decoy separately and then you apply this formula whatever I just now told FDR is a ratio of decoy to target. 
Now, what happens in the case of so whatever just now I said is very generic. Those who uh, probably did not understand the FDR, so that is how, how I uh, narrated in a, in a uh, brief manner. In proteogenomics case, what happens is that you take the genomic sequence, you translate computationally and create the protein sequences and thereby you inflate the database size. So, the database when it is inflated, the chance of FDR enormously increases. Earlier we used to search let us say only uh, the known protein from Swiss prot we took and search our mass spec data in a limited number of proteins. In case of proteogenomics, I take all the theoretical ORFs in case of prokaryotes or translated transliptomic in, in case of uh, eukaryote and inflate the database size. Now, when we inf inflate the database size, the chance of false discovery increases. How? Supposing you are looking for a place let us say Bhubaneswar and I have given you only the map of Orissa and you are searching Bhubaneswar. So, the chance of once you get it, it will be correct. I give you a world map and then ask you search Bhubaneswar. So, there are chances that by chance you will get another uh, city with, with a similar name with one letter uh, change here and there and then you start getting confused which, is, which one is the right one, which one is the wrong one. So, this is the same thing happens as, as soon as you increase the database size, your false discovery rate increases and then you need to do, but you have to do proteogenomics. So, database size has to increase. So, you have to find out where, how do I limit my false discovery rate even though I search in the larger database. Any suggestion? I need to increase my database size because I have to do proteogenomics. But at the same time I want to reduce my false discovery, I want to reduce my false discovery. What do I do? What is the way out? Answer would be there in the next slide, but just for interaction sake. You can be wrong, no, no problem, but still participate. Uh, select the peptides with very high score, that means a purist model. So, the chances of being wrong will be less, that is one way but you will definitely lose many other uh, uh, correct peptides in the process. That is another one way definitely. Any other way? Can replication, ok. So, two different experiments you look for the same peptide being identified. Uh, so, you, you force me to go to the biologist and ok, ask them to do a replicate study. Of course, that is a good idea always. Uh, but we can always increase our search engines. We can use different different search engines and uh, take their results and hope that multiple search engines will not simultaneously fail in, in giving you uh, a wrong result. So, uh, this is one way we thought of uh, in the computational lab where, where can we improve our search result, maybe include results from multiple search engines. So, what we did? We created a pipeline which will do all this process automa automation at the same time take result from various search engine, one in house, but others from other sources and take results from all the search engine and then try to uh, analyze the data and hope that the chance of uh, being wrong is less. What happened when we did this? We got a scenario like this, another question coming your way. Now, world is not that simple to me, all search engines gave different different results. Now, what do I do? Who do whom do I trust? What do you do if you get results like this? Same experiment, same database, search parameters being same, the search engines are giving you different results. And you are a PhD student and you have to take a call now, take. <laughs> Take the overlapping, somebody said consensus from here, I think both of, the, both of you are telling the same thing. Any, I mean if you are agreeing to this idea, no need, but any, any other radical thinking idea is coming? Elimination on what basis? On their, on their scoring value, ok. So, this, this is one uh, different idea is coming, compare their scores 
and then eliminate the weak, weaker ones. Now the problem with me is that a student coming out of IIT Bombay, if he gets even 30, 80, 70 percent mark, he is a smarter student and a student coming out from uh, unknown university from a remote place is getting 95 percent but still is not a smart student. Now our evaluation processes are not streamlined. So relying on the score that the student has got was not probably a judicial uh, uh, smarter way of doing that. But of course, we are thinking in that line, can we rescore them? Can we create an entrance examination for all of them to reappear and come through that uh, entrance examination again? So something in that line we are thinking, but our first thought was whatever you people you suggested, take the consensus one, easiest probably and little bit safest, but definitely not the smartest. So we went ahead with this took all those peptides that were identified with two or more algorithms and made our story went ahead published and that is how generally you know under pressure you do. But then we were not happy with the way I, as a computational biologist we handled this problem. So we started observing what is the behavior of this FDR. So you look at this curve and try to understand that how the FDR is uh, behaving as the score is reducing. So, the score is reducing to the right and the FDR axis is in the y axis and you know the FDR was 0, all of a sudden a red bullet comes, the FDR shoots up. And then more and more greens are coming, the FDR is going down and then another red hit comes and then it goes, goes up. So, this is the function by which the FDR is jumping up and down. Now this problem with us is that a peptide which is identified at with a higher score had higher FDR than a peptide which is identified with lower score had lower FDR. This is not acceptable. How can you have a person having higher score and still has high false discovery rate? So, what we did we created a step function and tried to join through a linear line at the base of this next FDR line. And this was fairly okay with us because still the FDR is same for this peptide as well as this peptide, for this score as well as this score, the FDR is same. But the best was when we joined these points through a linear regression lines. And now we have a curve which is going upward as the score goes down then you get the FDR is going upwards. What was interesting is that all the methods irrespective of it is mass switch, sequest, OMSA, tandem whatever you take this green line this behavior of this green line was preserved. So, it was easier for us to create a cutoff for FDR score and then use that FDR score for all the methods and choose the peptides. So, what we did? We took the E value, P value, P value score whatever we had the, the evaluation parameter the matrix we had and then applied on all the methods and at a given cutoff for all these algorithms we selected those peptides which is uh, following that cutoff criteria. So, that part is over now. Now, multiple algorithms search results integration and then getting a pool of peptides from there is what we could achieve. But the main problem was to identify proteoforms. So, how do I now get the proteoforms? We have created a translated transcriptomic database. We have now created multiple algorithms and then rationalizing the results from multiple algorithms. Now, can we have an end to end solution for, for a mass spectrometry person coming with a data and, and do a proteogenomics end to end solution. So, to do that we needed a bridge for this and we constructed this bridge. So, we named it as uh, Genosuit, uh, rest of the talk is will be little bit boring because that I will beat my own drum, this is what we have done. But nevertheless uh, just see, see that what we have done, for prokaryotes it was much easier for us. 6 frame translated database creation it was cakewalk and we could get 
the genome re annotated with uh, new ORFs identification. But whereas for eukaryotes we had lots of difficulty because we had to create the 3 frame translated transcriptome and then and incorporate all the possible uh, alternate uh, splice forms into our proteome. To do that we had created this pipeline by taking the best of uh, tools available elsewhere. So, we did not write any of these codes. So, we took uh, the SRA, Trimomatic, STAR, Coughlinks, whatever was available for analyzing the rna data. All that we require is our set of protein sequences which represents this transcriptome and this is our source space. And then using that using multiple uh, search engines we wanted to get the peptides and from peptides infer the protein. I am using the word infer because it is a bottom up approach what we get are the actually the peptides, but what we pose that as if we understand the protein now we know the which protein was there. So, from these blocks we, we, we infer what are the proteins that we probably would have got. From the first part the prokaryotic story uh, we published several papers in which used using this particular uh, uh, pipeline we could identify new translated regions in Sigella flexionary in uh, Bradyrhizobium japonicum and Methanobacter extracurans and there are if there are students in this audience who are uh, computationally oriented and want to do something. So, here is some, some low hanging fruit for you uh, as a researcher what you can do take mass spectrometry data from the internet, take genome proteome data from the internet, use some of these tools and then start re annotating the genome using the experimentally available mass spec data and the static information of the genome data and you, you can do wonders by sitting at a lab uh, in a place with a computer and internet connection you can do all these things. So, some of these also I could get it done through uh, the trainees who come to my lab and uh, we could re annotate the genome identify novel uh, translated regions. So, for that the resource is available already. So, browse the internet you will find many places where you get mass spec data and from there you can uh, download data. What we have done and for our purpose since uh, the prokaryotic part is already uh, I mean some whatever we wanted to do we wanted more challenging jobs. So, we wanted to go to human proteoforms. So, we looked at the resources and with lots of effort and difficulty uh, we could arrive here although it looks pretty uh, easy simple to uh, you. From the resource it was difficult for us to identify which are those projects that will give us brain specific mass spec uh, blood specific lung specific and different different tissue wise mass spec data because you cannot download the entire data and then re annotate and then segregate. We wanted to create a pipeline which will go talk to the pride database massive database and other uh, resources and once you type brain it will fetch all the brain related mass spec metadata and give it to you for the analysis. So, for that we created this human tissue scape and this is the statistics uh, of uh, the pride projects where you can see uh, the how many number of uh, projects we have per tissue uh, and then we group them on the basis of their uh, group identification DOI or the publication date when it has come and that is how we could group them. As you can see it took about several months for us to analyze a tissue by tissue what are the where are the uh, proteoforms and uh, after doing the analysis we realize oh this is not the human tissue as I was looking for it is just a cell line. So, lot of uh, back and forth we had to do uh, a lot of lesson we had to le we learned while doing all these things that it is not that straightforward you type lungs and you get it and then you get that is some some other uh, cell lines uh, which people have already done the analysis. So, right now uh, my student Anurag who is here. Uh, he is focusing only on brain and uh, this is only a handful of data sets that we have analyzed using the this strategy of uh, eugenosuit using Nexplot, Swissplot and Gencode we could identify several uh, proteoforms in various tissues 
uh, and all these uh, proteoforms now have been uh, okay this is this is interesting I am I run out of time I need, I need another 5 minutes okay okay sorry uh, this is something very interesting uh, another puzzle which is yet to be solved um, in a computational pipeline manner otherwise right now a lot of involvement is required see these are the isoforms these are the peptides it was much easier for us only when we are we had a unique unique peptide for that particular proteoform which is not shared with other proteoforms. So, these proteoforms could be identified and then they have been put into the database. These are all the proteins, their function, their gene names and number of proteoform each of them has. For example, tau protein if you look, you, you look into it then you see that these are the various proteoforms of tau available seen in how many different projects how many distinct peptides were identified in that uh, particular protein and but then this came. What is this? These are different proteoforms of tau, these are different peptides and this puzzle is for you not for me. Which proteoform is present? If you see a data like this, what would be your answer? Somebody took a stand first peptide 3 is that what you are saying these two so in this case what we have to see like suppose if i am talking about peptide 5 and 6 so peptide 5 has three uh, uh, proteins the peptide 5 is mapping to three different proteoforms yeah proteoform and 6 is mapping to two yeah so two we will label what uh, peptide 5 that the tau f we can say this protein is there tau f is there Based on this much data, you will say tau f is there. <laughs> okay, so there is no simple solution to this problem. Even even the answer that I will give you, we can spend another half an hour debating on that. But <laughs> we chose it like this. We mapped all these peptides onto their transcript. As you can see, for every match, we say that evidence for D tau uh, fetal E F but not G. For the pink peptide that is this one, these are all possible not these two possible, now this, these two possible. For the green peptide where are the green one? Yeah, this is here. For this green peptide evidence for this but not this. So, this but not this, this but not this through a series of statements like this and also from other because this could not be shown in one single slide I broke them into another slide. So, evidence of tau d and fetal tau comparing all of them together we just given an answer that probably these are the three proteins most likely I mean the answer is most likely these are the three proteoforms which are there in my sample. But as I told you very clearly that we can again debate for another one hour or overnight on this why this is possible why that is not possible. Uh, so, we have to go back to the data and then you can see look at the peptides the this particular peptide is a unique peptide which clearly says after E the AEE comes which is which is uh, very difficult to read from here. So, which will tell that one only one proteoform is possible other proteoform cannot explain uh, such a separation of the uh, peptides. So, I hope from this lecture of Dr. Devashi Das, you got a glimpse of how one can process the proteomic samples and prepare a database to facilitate mass spectra data understanding and analysis. You also learnt about preferable limit and role of fast discovery rate in mass spectrometry data analysis. We have also learnt about the hurdles which are related to the multiple algorithms available for data analysis. Dr. Devashis explained about the possible ways to eliminate and how to select the proteins from differently used algorithms. We have also learnt about 
various sites for database search like Uniprot, Nextprot and GeneCode to make customized database for the study. Use of hubs prot for accessing already reported proteoforms of a gene could be another valuable resource. So, the next lectures we are going to shift gears and now Dr. Mani will take you to workflows of automated data processing. Thank you.